This week on a lively experiment, the Board of Elections reverses course, saying it won't investigate the specifics of the Sabina Matos signature scandal. And a challenge to a new state law regulating shoreline access finally makes it to a courtroom. A lively experiment is generously underwritten by. Hi, I'm John Hazen White Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program and Rhode Island PBS. Joining us with their insights, Providence College political science professor Adam Myers, political contributor Don Roach, and Providence Journal reporter Antonia Nuri Farzan. Hello and welcome to this week's Lively. I'm Jim Hummel. Never mind, after, a month after approving plans to subpoena some campaign workers for Sabina Matos in her much publicized CD1 signature scandal, the Rhode Island Board of Elections on Tuesday decided not to pursue any further investigation. Instead, it will now be up to Attorney General Peter Narona, who has given no indication of a timetable on his own investigation of the fraudulent signatures. Um, Adam, let me begin with you and welcome. Um, any surprise here? They did kind of a, a 180. Should they have done it? Were you surprised? I think it's a close call. Uh, I think it was interesting that the state's two leading uh, government watchdog organizations, the ACLU and Common Cause, had a different position on this matter. The ACLU you know, wanted the investigation to close, or the, their view was the attorney general's handling it, you know, subpoena, subpoenaing uh, these campaign workers would have a chilling effect on future campaign workers. Uh, Common Cause thought, well, we, we really need to get to the bottom of this. Um, and I should mention that I'm on the governing board of Common Cause, so it won't surprise you to learn. I think that it was a mistake. You know, the, the taxpayers, the citizens of Rhode Island deserve to know what happened. It's important. It's important to get to the bottom of this so that it doesn't happen again. I wonder how much of this, too, is that Sapina Matos got creamed in the primary. I don't know whether that factors in at all. She's kind of now forgotten in maybe rearview mirror, or maybe not. I don't know. I mean, if so, that's kind of bad luck for the Board of Elections. I mean, either way, to say before the election, oh, we're going to subpoena everyone, and after the election, when she's lost, you know, come back and say, well, never mind. No, we're not. It does seem like that ACLU letter factored pretty heavily. Um, I know some board members cited that letter basically saying don't do this as their reason for you know not moving forward with this but you know there's this whole narrative that's built up that this was kind of political interference that she's been kind of persecuted and it definitely doesn't help when something like this happens it definitely seems politically motivated if after the election that she lost we're like yep okay it's all good um, it's almost like we we were able to do what we wanted to do which is you know, take out the front your, runner? Your, your campaign, but now we don't need to do that. For me, I feel like an investigation should still happen. We want to deter people from whether it's, it's maliciously or not, but taking as like, like gathering signatures very seriously. And if there was any malintent by some actors, as you know, I think she said it's possible that it could have happened with some folks she, she hired, um, we don't want that in our elections. Adam, as I read it, the ACLU concern was that there was going to be, you had mentioned the chilling effect. Oh, if they start subpoenaing people, you know, the workers are going to be worried about going out. If you're doing your job, you got nothing to worry about. I don't, I don't get that argument. Well, that's true, except as best as we can tell, only two of the 11 signature gatherers on the Matos campaign have been implicated in this, right? But um, the proposal was to have all 11 come and testify. And, you know, even if you did nothing wrong, you know, you've got to be worried about perjuring yourself. Do I get a lawyer? Right, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I'm just putting myself in the position of a campaign worker, you know, and, and asking myself, would I really want to work on a campaign in Rhode Island gathering signatures, interacting with voters in this way, knowing that something could go wrong and I could be called to testify before the Board of Elections? I just don't know what I would think if I were in that situation. Yeah, I also wonder, well, we all saw the candidates. I saw Walter Burbrick in front of my Shaw's in my town. And I, I never signed just because of the position we're in. But I also wonder whether this is going to have any chilling effect on people when they go to 
ask them to sign because they're like, is Tim White going to show up at my door or some other reporter to say, hey, is this really your signature? Yeah, that we're going to know what I signed. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know how closely people follow it and if that's really going to translate a couple years from now when there's the next petition drive. I feel like a lot of people just sign it because they want the person to get out of their way so they can load their groceries into the car most of the time. What do you think the board, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't want to be afraid of ghosts, though. Like, you know, when you're you're gathering signatures, you're going to people's houses, you know, you can have, as, as, a, as a former candidate, some really good conversations with people. They want to sign. It's all part of the, the democratic process. Um, but at the same time, we want safeguards in place so that people don't abuse the system. She still gathered enough signatures or had enough signatures kind of like certified. But I do think if... If nobody does anything about this, then the, the, the answer is, well, this, you can still do this in the future. Okay, so we are neck deep now, or just getting into it, in the CD1 race, and you were neck deep in the primary. You guys, you did a lot of uh, primary coverage, you and Patrick Anderson. Let, new, the, it's been 10 days, but new panel. Were you surprised by the, by the results? I, mean, I was surprised how quickly we got the results. I was gearing up for it to be a late night. You know, I was ready. And to be mail up ballots. Yeah, and, yeah, right. waiting for the mail ballots, thinking we maybe wouldn't know, you know, by the time we went to print, maybe we wouldn't know for a couple of days. And... I mean, by 9 o'clock, we were kind of wrapped up and knew who'd won, which was, yeah. So, yeah, I don't think the result was necessarily surprising. That definitely was always a possibility. I mean, I will, not that I predicted it. You know, I'd pre-written about four different stories, you know, as we do as reporters trying to predict different outcomes. So, yeah, but, yeah, definitely thought it was going to be a lot closer, whoever came in first. Were you surprised by Amo? I would say I was moderately surprised. I had a sense that voters in CD1 were searching for an alternative to Regenberg in the aftermath of Matos's collapse. And I guess you could say I thought that person might be Amo, given all the exposure he was getting on TV, given how well he did in the, in the debate a week before the primary. Um, and so, you know, I, there, I had an inkling that he might win, but I thought that the, the size of his victory, that the nine percentage points separating him and Regenberg, that I wouldn't have expected. And that's probably why we thought if it's close, then it goes to mail ballots and is it going to be a couple of days? Surprised? I wouldn't say that I really followed it that closely, um, but from a surprise You're waiting for the main event, right? <laughs> well, yes, the Democrats would say that was the main event, but yes, I hold out hope that November is truly the main event. <laughs> but um, no, I think he just is a, just a, he's portrayed himself as like, you know, which he is, you know, a son of immigrants from, from Pawtucket, just a regular guy who's just trying to, you know, do well for, for, for the state. And I think that he wasn't as political as some of his other opponents, or politicized, I should say. Yeah, and he didn't, it was, it was positive as far as I could see. At the end, some outside money came in, you know, throwing a little mud, but he always kept the positive message. I joked last week, it, you know, his ads made it sound like he had the nuclear codes and he was like, you know, yeah. vacationing with Joe Biden at Rehoboth Beach. Yeah, but, you right. know, that's the way it's going to be. Yeah. So now we get to the main event. Um, what is, what, Gary Leonard has to introduce himself, basically, in a way that Gabe Amo did five months ago. What, what is his challenge? Uh, his challenges are many, and I would respectfully disagree with my colleague that this November election is the main event. I think the Democratic primary was the main event because, let's face it, this is a Biden plus 30 district, and Gary Leonard's chances are very slim. Listen, um, he's doing all the right things right now, right? He is playing the hand that he's been dealt, that being the Republican nominee in an overwhelmingly Democratic district, pretty well. You know, he's talking about how he's a common sense guy. Uh, you know, constituency over party. He's calling himself a Yankee Republican, uh, saying he doesn't have a social agenda. You know, to be perfectly honest, this is the formula for a Republican to win in Rhode Island if we were in 1993, not in 2023, right? But in 2023, people tend to vote their party. People focus a lot on the profile of the national parties. And, you know, I th I, to be perfectly honest, I don't think he can overcome that. You're going to be covering, I assume? Yeah, I mean, it seems almost kind of like we're going to get a replay of the CD2 race in the sense that's going to be one guy saying, you know, don't vote for this guy, he supports Biden. The other one saying, don't vote for this guy, he supports Trump. And both of them kind of throwing mud in that way. But in this case, it's really not um, a competitive district like it was last time. Um, 
Yeah, I do think um, it's kind of, it'll be interesting to see Leonard introduce himself more. During the primary, he was very media shy. Um, you know, we definitely tried to reach out to him a number of times to do, a, you know, a candidate questionnaire, come down for a video interview, and just kind of kept not even being rebuffed, but just being like, okay, we'll get back to you and not having a response. So it'll be interesting to learn more about him, honestly. I thought, look, I, I read uh, Patrick's piece on, on uh, Monday in political scene, Patrick Anderson, your colleague, and I think he's, he's um, navigating the right way. You know, I wouldn't want a federal abortion ban. Well, that we've learned in other parts of the country, if you, if you go the Ron DeSantis route or the Kansas route, that might be a problem. Um, but I was surprised by that too, Antonio. He basically passed on free coverage on the mm -hmm. front page of the Sunday yeah, Journal yeah. and said that his, his campaign said, we've received the questionnaire, we're just not going to answer it. Who does that? It's got to be some national. Baffling. I mean, who would do I that? Know. What's interesting is how little national involvement there have been. I mean, I'm not the first person to point this out, but reporters you know, have, keep getting these press releases from the National Republicans attacking Seth Magaziner, who is not <laughs> on the ballot this year. We haven't gotten yeah. anything about Gabe Amo. You know, it, it almost seems like the National Party is not paying attention to this. Well, race. I don't think right. there's, there's not. I mean, what was it, $18 million last year? Because no. that seat was at stake. Right. Yeah. We're, I don't think we're going to see any national money this year, do you? If we do, it's going to be very little. And I think that's telling, right? I don't think the National Republican Party considers this a competitive seat. Um, and, you know, I guess you could say in a special election that is going to be low turnout, things can happen. But I think the chances of this not being an AMO victory are very, very slim. There would have to be something unexpected happen, you know, an AMO scandal, a major AMO gaffe. Um, but even then, you know, in a district like this, I just don't see it. So I think uh, Leonard is an attractive candidate, you know, 30 years military experience. He's moderate. Um, but just what I've seen of him, I feel like the thing that he needs to do that I think Amo did well is just just be yourself. Don't try to uh, define yourself as the not this person. Define yourself as you. And I think he, he would be very attractive to, to Rhode Islanders. But a lot of times people get into candidates' ears, like this is how you should run, this is how you should answer that question. But you gotta be yourself. Being yourself, Trump won by being himself. If he had tried to be somebody else, one, he couldn't have done it, and two, he wouldn't have won without being himself. And I think for all candidates, be yourself and see if that is compelling to voters. Well, I was gonna, just going to say, speaking of Trump, you know, from what I've seen of Leonard and the interviews that he's been doing recently, he's trying to distance himself from Trump, you know, saying he doesn't want to talk about him. But I don't think that works in a, in a race for Congress. I mean, let's face the truth. Yeah. Trump is in all likelihood going to be the Republican nominee. That makes him the standard bearer for Leonard's party. Leonard's running for a national office, so if he's elected to Congress, he's going to have to interact with the President of the United States. Um, you can't avoid uh, the Trump issue uh, when you're running for Congress. We haven't gotten into the debates yet, but, you know, hearkening back to CD2, Seth Magaziner kept pounding away the first vote. I don't care how moderate you are, the first vote you're going to take are for the crazies, <laughs> right? Yeah. For Kevin McCarthy and the whole, you know, the right wing squad, the Marjorie Taylor Greens and all of that. I wonder how much of that's going to come up that, to remind people what's at stake in Congress. Oh, yeah, I would think absolutely once we get to the debates. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, with the Trump question, absolutely, that's a question he's going to have to answer at some point. I mean, people want to know. They want to know. Where do you fit in within the Republican Party? Mm -hmm. he's, it looks like he's agreed to a lot of debates. I think that's probably good, right, for Gary? That is good for him when you're, you're likely not to win. You need those opportunities. So, too, like why he didn't answer that questionnaire, I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, and the other thing, it's got to be coming from outside. When he, I've never seen this in the 40 years I've been here, he announced Normally, you'd have the big podium. Now, they, some people do it on, um, on social media. He announced and specifically excluded reporters from the announcement. I thought, well, that's a missed opportunity, wouldn't yeah. you think? You wouldn't have done that, candidate Don Roach, would you? Candidate Don Roach would not have done that. But, um, you know, I think Republicans in this state t typically do, like, make not common sense kind of like decisions when they're when they're doing things and I think they alienate themselves from Rhode Island voters and it's just common sense you want reporters there if, if any kind of attention is good attention especially when you're a completely unknown candidate final thoughts on the race um, I don't think there are going to be any surprises I think I'm going to win this thing carry you know easily and you know as I said earlier the only thing that could change that is a is a 
an October surprise, so to speak. Yeah. Stranger things have happened. All right. Well, we got you both on tape. So, all right. Uh, another issue that we've talked about a lot and was big at the end of the uh, legislative session is the, le uh, the General Assembly passed a pretty, um, pretty significant shoreline access bill. And you may have seen people are testing this now. They used to have security guards out. They really don't want to have the controversy anymore. So it allows you 10 feet up from the seaweed, the rack line, however you're the high tide, whatever you want to call it. And there's a court challenge from some property owners, a coalition. Antonio, you were in court this week because this is the first it's reaching in federal court. Correct. Yeah. I mean, basically at this point, both sides are arguing should the should this even be in federal court? Should it get kicked down to state court? Are the plaintiffs even suing the wrong people? So it's very much procedural at this point. Um, definitely the state, you know, trying to get it thrown out. Um, the Attorney General's office, which is defending the state in this. But it was kind of interesting to get a bit of a preview of, you know, even though it'll be a while before we have a decision on this underlying question, which is, is this a taking of private property? You could kind of tell they were testing out the arguments on court. The judge had definitely done his homework, definitely knew a lot about this issue and was really pushing back on both of them. It is funny because the, the judge, Will Smith, who I've known for years, he's from Idaho, mm. but he's gotten he's gotten a lot of, uh, I'm sure, shoreline access things in the past. Just set the, for people who haven't been paying attention, exactly what the law does and what the property owners, they think it's a taking of their property. Correct. So basically the law says that you can be on the beach if you're with above 10 feet of the seaweed line, wherever that is that day, and that the public has the right to use that. So the argument from the property owners is essentially you just gave the public an easement to my property and we and that that's a taking without compensation. However, crucially, they're not asking for compensation. This came up in court. Um, the judge kind of asked, well, you haven't asked for any money here. And they said, yeah, that's not what we want because that line is almost moving. So how are we supposed to figure out what compensation even would Get be? Get your mitts off our property, <laughs> basically. Right. Yeah, they just don't want people there. Yeah. Yeah, so in, in reading Antonia's coverage of this, my perception was that the plaintiffs, the property owners, they sort of overshot here, right? They went directly to federal court and they're asking a federal judge to declare a state law unconstitutional. And, and for a federal judge, that's a heavy lift. I mean, yes, they do have the power to do that, um, but they generally try to be deferential to state, state laws and state legislatures because state legislatures were elected by the people, federal judges were. And, you know, just as Antonia said, the, the judge, you know, he asked the lawyers for the plaintiffs, well, why didn't you just go to state court and, and seek compensation there? And they said, well, because it's too hard, uh, given that the line is moving and so forth. And it sounds like Judge Smith was skeptical of that argument. So, yeah, basically, you can figure it out. There's right. experts who can so, figure this out. So for me, I guess how I've thought about this issue um, is like, is it like a sidewalk for the beach? Like you're just walking along the beach and as long as you stay within these parameters, you have a right to, to walk wherever. Cause I don't know if you can put chairs down. Although I thought about it as like in front of my house, you know, people could like on the sidewalk, on the sidewalk like yeah. just sit down, hang out. And it might be inconvenient or annoying to me, but they probably have a right to do so. And so I, I, I think the law, when I first thought, I was like, yes, no, this doesn't make any sense because it's private property. But at the same time, you can't like walk through private property just to get to the, these spaces. And so it just, to me, it kind of makes sense. Like it's like a little sidewalk, but you can't go through private property. And that I, I don't think the, the, the people who are, the plaintiffs are gonna win this battle. And it, it, go ahead. I was going to say, that sidewalk ex analogy is exactly what one of the commission members who helped draft this law used when they were working on that. So, we were on the commission and we didn't know. I was not. <laughs> the, the but sidewalk. There is, I will say, there's an, uh, the, you know, the question that they didn't address at all is your point about can you set up chairs. They very right. deliberately avoided that and basically mm -hmm. said a court is going to have to figure that out at some point. Yeah, but there have been people who have brought towels. Yeah. I mean, we're here. Why shouldn't we be able to stay right. here? It's not yeah. just a pass-through. Maybe that'll be the new, we'll call it the sidewalk doctrine. And we'll, <laughs> and we'll give it to you. So why federal? court initially what was the thought because it's speedier? fifth amendment it's taking spe yeah. yeah yeah they're trying to make it a federal issue yeah i think the other issue that you talked about don is it's the it's the north south versus the east west getting that's a, been a huge deal in rhode island is all these private owners blocking off what are really crmc and locally approved public access that's been one of the problems yeah that's the next issue to, it's established but to open it up and to enforce it that's right 
but th and that's an issue that shouldn't be resolved in federal court, right? right I mean, there's right, right. other avenues for resolving that. Which so I go back to what I said earlier. It just seems like the plaintiffs are asking for too much. Yeah. All right. One other story that Antonia did this week. This is a classic Rhode Island story. And Don, you'll appreciate this because you live in Cranston. The yeah. Bud Long Pool. We have been talking about the Bud Long Pool. You would have thought this was like, well, whatever. So set, set the table. It's I think. Even if you don't live in Cranston, you know about the Bud Log Pool. Yeah, it's, it's the biggest huge. pool in Rhode Island. People have been going. How big is it? You can. It's fit. bigger than Olympic size pool. Yeah. Yeah. And so the issue is Mayor Hopkins has stepped in a is, has stepped in a hornet's nest because he wanted to pull the plug on it, right? Right. So the mayor's argument basically is we need to get rid of this old pool. It's costing us too much money to, to fix it up. You know, that's just kicking the can down the road. We need a new pool and we need a smaller pool because it doesn't make sense of a pool this big anymore. But there has been pushback basically ever since he brought out this plan. So we're now going on a year and a half where he's been arguing with the city council about this. And at this point, it's looking like there isn't going to be either a new pool or an old pool next summer. So at this point, it will have been, you know, his entire term without anyone being able to use a pool. Yeah, and it may be. Well, you go ahead, Mr. Cranston. Yeah, I know. I, again, the, the mayor of Cranston um, is, was, was a teacher in Cranston for many years. He's like a man of the people. So this particular issue for me is tough because the people are saying we want we want the pool mm -hmm. and he's taking a position that is antagonistic to, to, to like what the people are saying. And so I, I, I think it's going to I do think it will hurt him politically if he chooses to run next year. Um, for me, let's fix up the pool like it, it's like, you know, one of the biggest pools around. I mean, it draws in a lot of people. You've got tons of pictures of people who have used the pool. I understand it, it, it actually may not make the most economic sense, but it may make more community sense. Right. Yeah, that's my perception too. So first of all, let me just say at the outset, I have never been to this pool. We're <laughs> taking a field trip after the show. We're yeah. driving down to yeah. Cranston. Right. Well, after <laughs> seeing pictures of this pool, I was like, holy cow, this is a massive pool. I can understand why people see it as like a genuine, like iconic Cranston landmark. And so, yeah, I think the mayor did step into a hornet's nest here. And um, it's, he's going to have a hard time getting out of it, especially because his likely opponent in the next uh, mayoral race is already criticizing him for it. Barbara Ann Fenton Fung ju is jumping into the pool, pun fully <laughs> intended. And is that a preview of a race next year? I don't know. I mean, it certainly could be, as I was saying earlier about, you know, Republicans don't always make common sense decisions. I really don't want them to cannibalize each other. Um, I know uh, M Mayor Hopkins and former Mayor Fung had a very good working relationship. To me, I don't, I feel like this is not the hill to die on. There's so few of you, Don. We can't be, um, we but can't at the be same time, each other. at the same time, like I said, the community feels very strongly about it. And so it's a, it's a hot button issue for them. Um, but if I were the Democrats, I just would be just... Uh, eating some popcorn and just watching the fireworks because, um, yeah, it just it seems like it's an issue that has become more of an anchor for Mayor Hopkins as it just goes on and on. What's the next? Where does it go from here? <laughs> you don't know. That's the question. Well, right? Yeah. Are, are you getting an answer? I mean, part of the issue is the, the city council has approved spending ARPA money on the pool. Now there's kind of an argument about, well, did they approve spending that money on a new pool, or were they saying they were going to fix up the old pool? I mean, the entire thing is And it's a lot of ARPA money. It's, it's a, a lot, lot of money. money. That millions. could be going yeah. to other things. Yeah, so I, yeah. I don't see there being an answer to this anytime soon, and I do think it is very much going to turn into a campaign issue, because that's such a low-hanging fruit to be able to say, hey, you know, this is the guy who's keeping the pool closed. You okay. can just pick the mailers. Okay, let's go to uh, outrageous Andrew. Kudos. Don, let's begin with you this week. So I think it's an outrage just with... Um, Electric rates looking like they're going to uh, increase for the fall again. Um, for me, just looking at my own electric bill last year and comparing, it's like, what what is going on? Um, like you got to tell just, your kids to start reading by candlelight. <laughs> yeah, too much yeah. electricity use in the road right. household. Yep, stop using their like Nintendo Switch and Playstations. But I really think about people um, who, you know, they are on a very defined budget. They can't take 33% increases and then are going to have to beg, borrow, and steal and then just continue to be behind the eight ball. And I don't know if, um, you know, the electric companies really take that into consideration. 
Yeah, we shall see. Antonia, what do you have? So I was outraged reading the story that my colleague Wheeler did about the flooding over the weekend at the Dean Estates in Cranston, where he describes how this disabled man almost drowned in his own apartment because so much water came flooding in so quickly. I just, you know, and when you look back at how many times that building has flooded, you just kind of wonder how was this ever allowed to be built? Who thought this was a good idea? I know there's a lawsuit now against the DOT kind of saying maybe they're to blame with the drainage from the road. I don't know the ins and outs of that. I don't know who's responsible, but it seems like people should not have to worry that they are going to drown if there's a heavy rainstorm in the middle of the night. You can imagine that coming in and he can't move and just the panic Nightmare. and, and yeah. all of that. Terrifying. Um, Adam, welcome. This is your lively debut. That's we right. hope to, should we let him back, guys? What do you think? Yeah. Oh, it's done. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You, you can come I back. Pass. But thank you. Adam's been waiting for the call for a couple of years. I don't know why we haven't had you on earlier, but it's a pleasure. Thank you. And do you have an outrage or a kudo? Uh, I guess a kudo, my kudo will go to Mindy Myers, who is uh, Gabe Amo's media consultant on his race, and I guess he was, she was also Sheldon, Sheldon Whitehouse's campaign manager back in the she day. She knows Rhode Island well. Yeah, so apparently she got some national recognition for her work on Amo's campaign because Joe Biden tapped her to head his polling operation going into 2024. That's so. good. Uh, let me let me stay with you. There's, as we like to say, there's always a Rhode Island uh, angle to almost every national story. Former uh, Rhode Island Congresswoman Claudine Schneider, this is in, uh, indicative of what's going on around the country. She's part of a Colorado effort now to keep Trump off the ballot because of what went on around January 6th. And I'm really torn on this because I think January 6th is serious. But should you just let the voters do it? So this is going on around the country. Do you see this as getting any kind of traction? Legally? I mean, I, I highly doubt uh, that uh, federal judges, certainly not the Supreme Court, are going to rule Trump ineligible to be on the ballot. Uh, look, you know, a case can be made uh, that uh, the former president is ineligible to be on the ballot via the insurrection clause of the Constitution to the American people, right? We can make that case to the American people, but it's a whole different thing to have unelected judges declare that for the American people. So you mentioned Rep, uh, Representative uh, Schneider, Schneider yep. and the Rhode Island connection. There's actually another Rhode Island connection here. It goes all the way back to 1849. That was when the Supreme Court heard a case called Luther v. Borden, which came out of Rhode Island, came out of the Door Rebellion, actually. And I won't go into the details of the case, but in that case, the Supreme Court came up with what, it's, what is now called the political questions doctrine, which is basically this idea that there are some legal questions or some constitutional questions that are so politically explosive that it's really not the role of the courts to decide them. And so I think this is a classic political question. The voters uh, should decide in 2024 if Trump is eligible to be president or not. Yeah, I mean, I'm generally a voters decide things. Um, and in this one, I just feel like it's just more fuel to Trump's fire of like, see, they're all out to get me, right. but Big I'm fighting for yeah. you. And it's very unlikely that he would be barred from the ballot if he gets the, the required signature. So what, what is the point? Yeah, at this point. All right, folks, I am sorry. That is all the time we have. Don, great to see you. Adam, welcome. And Antonia, good to see you. Folks, if you don't catch us Friday at 7 or Sunday at noon, all of our shows are archived at ripbs.org slash lively. We're all over social media, Facebook and uh, Twitter. And wherever you get your favorite podcast, take us along if you don't catch us on Sunday. We will be back here next week. We hope you have a great week, but we'll be back here next week as a Lively Experiment continues. Have a great weekend. A Lively Experiment is generously underwritten by... Hi, I'm John Hazen White, Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program and Rhode Island PBS.